So a lot of people have used the past two years of this slowly ending global situation to learn something new, useful, and interesting. While this was going on, I was reading a lot of Vampire the Masquerade lore. Now, this is one of the biggest role-playing games in the entire world. It is played traditionally at the gaming table, but it is also immensely popular in LARP. It has become such a major cornerstone of the vampire genre that it gets referenced in persiflage movies and shows like What We Do in the Shadows. And really the main question when coming up with any piece of vampire fiction is what are the vampires going to be like in this particular work? Almost every culture in the world has some form of vampire myth, sometimes even several. And with how long this kind of creature has been a massive feature of the cultural zeitgeist, there are countless renditions by countless creatives, so there are so many options to choose from. Not to mention, you can just make new shit up. The answer Vampire the Masquerade gave to this question was... Yes. There are a total of 13 clans in Vampire the Masquerade and a whole bunch of bloodlines that we're not going to talk about today. And they all have different attributes and abilities because they are descended of the 13 different antediluvian vampires. These are famously the vampires of the third generation. And while it is not clear that these are the only vampires of the third generation that ever existed, they are the only 13 ones that survived the flood, meaning they were were the only ones that were able to procreate. This is a very cool fact about vampire lore is that it's often ambiguous and contradictory which not only gives it a certain mystique but also makes it very forgiving to run because nothing is truly completely set in stone aside from like the most fundamental details. Clans are kind of your ethnicity as a vampire or kindred as they prefer. In practice this means that you share certain physical traits with other other members of your clan, certain personality attributes are a lot more frequent, you have been brought into the night through a similar cultural lens, and you probably have very strong connections mostly to other members of your clan. And yeah, look, listen, I know that this isn't how ethnicity really works. It's an arbitrary socially constructed category of categories that is used in anthropology. However, it is the analogy that tracks best for what a vampire clan is. The thing is, just like with ethnicity, every individual is still fundamentally their own person with their own personality, their own goals, abilities, and ambitions. So a given character can be pretty much anything that you want them to be. They don't have to agree with the loose, shared ideals and cultural norms of their given clan. Clans tend to turn, or as they call it, embrace certain specific types of people, but you don't become that type of person by being embraced into the clan. That's not how this relationship of causation works. So ultimately, you will find every category of person in every given clan. Of course, you will be affected by the prejudices that other people may or may not hold about your particular clan, which is something that unfortunately very closely tracks with ethnicity. Every clan also has a bane, a particular vampiric weakness that affects them. Very important though, no matter what clan you are, the sun will fuck you up. Vampiric society is roughly organized along three major governments or ideologies called sects. The Camarilla is the biggest and most influential of all of them, where most campaigns are set. They're an old school feudalistic society that clearly delineates and illustrates the ranks and positions and social order that they expect everyone to adhere to. And they see themselves as the sole legitimate government of all kindred. The Anarchs are an ultimately very ideologically diverse group that at some point said, hang on, we actually don't like this thing where we just are ruled by the elders of our clans all the way up to the antediluvians. Antediluvians, the very existence of which the Camarilla denies, by the way. So they did the Anarch Revolt a while back, 
and were mostly crushed by the forces of the Camarilla and the Human Inquisition. The Sabbat was kind of the ISIS of the Anarch Revolt. They became a very powerful organization dedicated religiously to the Jihad, which is the process of the younger generations destroying the elders so they can gain freedom from their rule and then rule humanity in turn. And even though they do want to rule the world openly, they still stick to the masquerade, which is a rule that kind of everyone adheres to because they know that if humans find out vampires exist on a large scale again, they will like kill most of them again. I will now give you an overview of all the 13 different vampire clans and instead of ordering them alphabetically, I have ordered them by relevance in terms of how likely you are to get in touch and how important they are going to be in a standard Vampire the Masquerade campaign, also called a Chronicle. We will start with the three patrician clans of the Camarilla, a distinction that is informal and mostly relevant to people who are interested in large-scale international Camarilla politics, because these are the three clans that between them hold the most princedoms, aka the most of the cities are ruled by these three clans. Keep in mind once again that there are princes of every clan in various different cities around the world and also any given member of a clan can be part of any given type of government or institution in the world of vampires. The grandiose and powerful clan Ventru, also known as the Blue Bloods, or the Clan of Kings, represents the aristocratic Machiavellian type of vampire with access to vast vast wealth. Throughout history they have occupied the position of pragmatic rulers of worldly matters, be that as knights during the medieval era or wealthy industrialists today. And they do in fact see themselves as the rightfully ruling clan over all the other vampires because what would the rabble do without their guidance? Even to this day a significant portion of new embraces into the clan of kings come from actual like real world nobility. In the the old world more so than the new for obvious reasons. Aristocrats tend to have very big bank accounts and a sense of decorum, which are two things that the Ventru really care about. They often embrace successful business people or people who they reckon have the potential to become very successful business people, but also stalwart figures in military or law enforcement positions that demonstrate good leadership and administrative skills. Before the embrace actually happens, there's usually a prolonged interview process, which obviously the intended recruit knows nothing about. They just think they're meeting very frequently with a very peculiar business partner that has taken a strange interest in them. This is then followed by intense and comprehensive coaching, some might call it micromanaging, to instruct the new arrival in the ways of the clan and the ways of the Camarilla. The clan has access to the disciplines Dominate, which is mind control, Fortitude, which is supernatural toughness, and Presence, which is incredible allure and charisma, making them very powerful social characters that are rather difficult to take down because of their physical and mental resilience. Between you and me though, the Ventru only need one discipline and it's called money. The Ventru clan bane is their rarefied tastes. Every kindred knows that not all blood is created equal and the Ventru can stomach only the finest caviar. Every Ventru has a particular type of person that they like to drink blood from and they have immense difficulty drinking blood from people who do not have that attribute. This attribute can be effectively anything so long as it isn't common. Uh, it could be twins, it could be vegans, it could be morbidly obese people, it could be people who can do calculus in their head good, it could be morbidly obese vegan twins who can do calculus in their head good. Every clan also has a compulsion, which is a particular neurosis that their beast, their vampiric side, will every once in a while really try to drive at the forefront of their mind. For the Ventru, this is arrogance. They need to rule, they need to be in charge, they need people to obey their commands. The Ventru antediluvian is called, drumroll please, Ventru. 
And not only is there very little known about him at all, but also officially, in keeping with Camarilla policy, Clan Ventru denies his existence. Evidence suggests, however, that he went to India after the destruction of the first city in the Flood, because basically most of the clan's ancient history takes place in India. Some notable Ventru include Fiorenza Saverna, who, despite being rather young, is a very influential figure in the inter-city connections, especially in Central America. Mithras, who, yes, is the sun god Mithras, which is brilliant, because if anyone asks asks you why you are only out at night, you can just tell them that you've been hauling the sun across the sky. And Lucinde, a powerful Justicar dedicated solely to her mission of eradicating the worst and most dangerous enemies of the Camarilla. The gorgeous and creative Clan Toreador, also known as the Roses or the Clan of Vanity, represents the highly seductive erotic type of vampire with an impeccable sense of style. They are practically in love with human civilization and culture, seeing themselves as the ultimate arbiters of what is based and what is cringe. Because their creative sparks tend to disappear over the centuries, they ultimately often take up the roles of patrons of the art, so they're all in the entertainment industry. Consequently, Toreador are primarily embraced from three major groups. Artists of all stripes and definitions, from sculptors to writers to figure skaters. Notable connoisseurs of art, like agents, uh, critics, or investors. And finally, just people who look good. That's a very valuable thing to have for the Toreador. The process of initiation into the clan can be quite nice. You get all this love and attention from this powerful old being and you have all your old and new incredible needs taken care of. Some might say you are being love bombed and thus ultimately become highly dependent on your sire. And with how particular Toreador can be and how easily bored they can get, you might just be dropped by the sidelines for a single misstep, or just because some new fascination entered their lives. The clan has access to the discipline's all specs, which are highly sharpened senses, celerity, which is super speed, and presence, which, like with the Ventru, is the great alluring charisma. And yes, I will be repeating what each of these mean, just so you can learn them. The Toreador clan bane is their aesthetic fixations, as they are so incredibly obsessed with aesthetics that they can cannot stand not being surrounded by things that satisfy their own personal beauty standards. This doesn't need to be like the objective high art, there can also be people who feel comfortable in like a trash can Oscar the Grouch kind of milieu, and they would feel very irritated in like a high society restaurant. It used to be in older editions they would just get absolutely transfixed with something beautiful that they would see, but I reckon they changed this because a few too many Toreador got transfixed with the beauty of the sunrise. This is represented in the newest edition, Vampire 5, with their compulsion, which is obsession, by which they really become hyperfixated on some particular thing, be it a person, a hobby, could be a particular song that they just have stuck in their head, and they're thinking about this thing all of the time and they just cannot get it out. So basically all Toreador have OCD, ADHD, and borderline personality disorder. The Toreador antidelude is Arakel, also known as Ishtar, the most beautiful woman who ever lived or unlived or ever will live or unlive, from the first city where she danced with bulls. Some claim she is actually the oldest of the Antediluvians, and even others claim that she is the twin sister of the Antediluvian Malkav. Some notable Toreador include Rafael de Corazon, probably the most well-known of the co-founders of the Camarilla, Catherine of Montpellier, a historian and probably the most influential cultural trendsetter of the vampiric society of continental Europe, and Melinda Galbraith, who was actually the leader of the Sabbat for a while, even though she was pretending to be of a different clan. The secretive and conniving Clan Tremere, also known as the Warlocks or the Pyramid, represents the kind of vampire what can do magic. Even though they are one of the most powerful clans in the Camarilla and everyone needs to deal with them, nobody really trusts them. And this isn't just because they can do fucking magic, but also because they kind of are a very young clan and stole their vampiric heritage. The kind of people that the Tremere 
embrace very a lot because they have this whole complicated process of asking various people for permission so that the leadership of the clan can determine who might be useful to the clan in the near future. They do have a tendency to embrace intellectuals, especially the kind of intellectual that has a little bit of a fascination with the occult. But probably the most important trait to have is an inborn tendency to accept authority. Because the Tremere are very authoritarian. Perhaps because they are not particularly old, they are the most explicitly organized of all of the clans, and they have a very strict chain of command, the Pyramid, as mentioned before, obedience to which was not so long ago enforced through the practice of blood bonding. That whole command structure has sort of deteriorated a little bit after the Second Inquisition destroyed the clan's headquarters in Vienna, but a lot of chronicles still play it the old-fashioned way. The clan has access to the discipline's auspex, which is highly sharpened senses, Dominate, which is mind control, and blood sorcery, which in older editions was known by the much cooler term thaumaturgy. Kinda self-explanatory, but also not because it's a very broad subject matter. This makes them ideal for perceiving magic, doing magic, and also ruling with an iron fist. The Tremere clan bane used to be that they could be very easily bloodbound, aka made obedient, to other vampires, but now with the shattering of the pyramid, it's actually become the inverse of that, in that they cannot bloodbind other kindred. Which of course gives a huge blow to their authoritarian structure. Their particular compulsion is called perfectionism, and it's just this overwhelming need to get this thing just perfectly right, and nothing short of an absolutely stellar performance will set their minds right again. Now the thing about the Tremere Antediluvian is that he is Saulot, who is also known as the vampire who actually is kind of a good guy, and he had a whole clan of his own which is now hunted pretty much completely to extinction. But the founder of Clan Tremere was actually Tremere. A very powerful mage who found a ritual to turn himself into a pick, I mean vampire, and then proceeded to diablerize Saulot, which means drinking his heart blood to consume his soul in order to elevate his own power and legitimize his clan. Now, funny thing is, the goal he had was to become vampires without losing access to the magic, which is not what happened at all. <laughs> they did lose their magic, all of them, big time, which was a problem because that's the one thing that they wanted to have them set apart, which led to the very interesting current situation where the Banu Hakim are going, hang, hang, on, hang on a second, right there, this is d the thing that you do with the magic, that's just our blood magic with the serial numbers filed off. Some notable Tremere include John D, who was a historical, actual, real-world figure that existed in the real world, but he, you know, wasn't a vampire, and is the current leader of all Tremere in the British Isles. Ashling Sturbridge, who is very young, but nonetheless a very powerful regent of the Chantry of New York. And Sri Sansa, who is notable to me personally because he fucked a lot. And I think that's cool. The passionate and free-spirited clan Bruja, also known as the Zealots or the Learned Clan, represents the classic punk rock archetype of vampire. Once upon a time, some might have called them a patrician clan of the Camarilla as well, but they would have vehemently fought against that definition because they identify with the proletariat, with the oppressed masses yearning for liberation. And the Bruja are right there with them to challenge authority, to fight the good fight. Bruja don't really have a lot of rules about who they embrace, uh, though it usually tends to be people of oppressed groups, or even more frequently, agents who are trying to change the status quo, usually from like counterculture scenes, or let's say uh, certain groups that uh, would do certain ops in order to achieve certain political goals. So essentially middle class kids who don't need to hold down three jobs to pay the bills and thus have the time to do high commitment activism. Now, while they are pretty cool, a lot of players like to romanticize them away from the fact that they are just hardcore ideologues who enjoy revolution for the sake of breaking shit. Many don't even believe in anything for the sake of believing it, they just believe in it because it is different than what they perceive to be the status as such, you will find a lot of hardcore tankies, Nazis, 
Khmer Rouge enthusiasts, and people who post about politics on Twitter among the ranks of the Bruja. They're also well known for giving little to no guidance to their childer. Very often they don't even know who their sire is or what even is going on with them, and so they die pretty quickly. Because of course helping a youngling navigate the complex intricacies of the knight in vampiric society is a huge responsibility, and Bruja will avoid that kind of thing like the play. Frankly, I respect that. The clan has access to the discipline Celerity, which is super speed, Potence, which is super strength, and Presence, which is alluring charisma, making them very intuitively well-rounded. Their powers are not some weird stuff, they're just human abilities driven to a great extreme. All of this also makes them extremely dangerous opponents in combat. The Bruja clan bane is their violent temper. They just have a big problem keeping the unbridled rage of their inner beast at bay. They are much more likely to frenzy than any other clan. In terms of compulsion, they feel strongly drawn to rebellion, needing to piss in the face of the person that they perceive to be in charge, or in some other way transgress against what would be the orderly way of doing things in this situation. The Bruja Antediluvian was Troil the Elder, an extremely calm and dispassionate guy who got diablerized by his child, Troil the Younger, whose unbridled burning passion then became the bane of their clan as punishment for their transgression against their sire. Some notable Bruja include Theo Bell, who is kind of responsible for them officially leaving the Camarilla and mainly aligning themselves with the Anarch movement now. Smiling Jack Drake, a pirate in life from that golden age of piracy who later became a very influential figure in the Californian Anarch Free State. And Tyler, who was one of the primary leaders of the Anarch Revolt. The enigmatic and mutated clan Nosferatu, also known as the Sewer Rats or the Clan of the Hidden, represents the hideously misshapen Count Orlok type vampire. Now even though you will definitely recognize a Nosferatu as being a Nosferatu when you see one, they are nonetheless masters of espionage and you should always assume that there is a Nosferatu in the room with you right now. Even though they're looked down upon by polite vampire society, their abilities are nonetheless highly valued and sought after by the Camarilla. The Nosferatu embrace from two groups of people who could could not be more distinct. On one hand, you have extreme social outcasts such as homeless people or drug addicts. But they also, much like the Toreador, like to embrace exceptionally beautiful people. Unlike the Toreador, they do this as a punishment for their arrogance and cruelty to the people who are less privileged than them. So becoming a Nosferatu of all the kindred world is probably the first choice of few people, their status as outcasts does give them a sort of increased cohesion within the clan, and they tend to be actually rather kind to each other. In their parallel society of the vast sprawling underworlds of every city in the world, clan counts for more than sex. So you have cordial relations between Nosferatu of the Camarilla, the Sabbat, and Anarchs. The clan has access to the discipline's animalism, which is control over animals, obfuscate, which allows them to become undetectable, and potence, which is super strength, making them not only perfect spy masters, but also dangerous ambush predators. The Nosferatu clan bane is that they're ugly as shit. That's it. That is the bane. Right, okay, so the reason this is the case is because when they turn into vampires, they undergo a transformation, extremely painful by the way, that completely changes the way that they look. And many of them even end up being unable to exist even as a vampire, because that is how far they have mutated. Some are even more hideous than the average Nosferatu. A very small select group is not quite as disgusting, but any Nosferatu, the second you see them, you will immediately know this is not a human, but some form of horrible monster, making it rather difficult for them to uphold the masquerade. The clan compulsion is cryptophilia, which is an intense need to know secret information that very few people are privy to. This is probably also one of the driving forces behind why they seem to know everything. The Nosferatu Antediluvian is Absimiliad, 
a massive asshole psychopath piece of shit who was also incredibly handsome and as such was punished for his appearance to reflect the appearance of his soul. He hates all his spawn and seeks to exterminate them but of course with the Nosferatu being a Camarilla clan they mostly don't even know he exists. Some prominent Nosferatu include Zelios, a genius architect and stonecutter who constructs elaborate labyrinths for reasons that only he quite understands. Baba Yaga, who is believed by some to be the progenitor of all modern members of the clan because she was the only one of Absimilian's childer who ended up procreating. And Calebros, who for a while was the Camarilla Prince of New York City. The wild and independent Clan Gangrel, also known as the Outlanders or the Clan of the Beast, is the archetypal country vampire that lives in the wilderness and is really more animal than person. Vampires are generally city people. They prefer to not be in the wilderness, where there is little in the way of consistent shelter and a lot in the way of dangerous shit. This is not true for the gangrel, who even when they are in cities prefer to stick to the parks and outskirts. They also like to travel a lot and they are the only clan that is even somewhat respected by the werewolves. They prefer to embrace people who are unafraid and have a will to survive. This often happens like pretty spur of the moment when a victim vehemently resists feeding, which is actually difficult because getting fed on by a vampire apparently feels very, very nice. But they will also sometimes pick out people that they notice are unafraid of moving through the wilderness at night. And so they will stalk and observe them, sometimes over a period of several months before embracing them if they find them worthy. Very few gangrel will ask you if you want to become a vampire. And actually, if you are a gangrel and you had the choice of becoming a vampire and took it, People are gonna look down on you in the clan, that's kind of something that they think is weak. The clan has access to the discipline's animalism, which gives them control over animals, fortitude, which is supernatural toughness, and protein, which gives them the ability to gain animal features or even transform fully into animals. The Gangrel clan bane is that they gain bestial features when they frenzy, uh, so this might be like uh, bat ears that then appear, or they have like a strong dog stench. It used to be they would then have this feature forever, but they changed this in Vampire 5 because I guess they realized that uh, if you have a frenzy once, like early on in the game, which will most definitely happen to you at some point, and you have a little bit of bad luck, you become just a walking masquerade violation without the benefit of having obfuscate as a clan discipline like the Nosferatu do. So now those features go away after a while. The clan compulsion is feral impulses, which every once in a while will really drive the gangrel to resolve a dispute through violence, the purest actual form of showing who is strongest and fittest and best to survive, and not this words bullshit, because they will have a pretty hard time talking. The Gangrel Antediluvian is Inoya, and it's very difficult to ascertain any information about her because all the lore about Inoya is passed through Gangrel lines via oral storytelling, and so there's a million different versions of Inoya. She may have been raised by wolves. That's one thing that may have happened. Some notable Gangrel include Cuthbert Beckett, a very notable scholar and archaeologist looking into the true origins of vampire kind. Odin the All High, who is, yes indeed, that particular Odin, though he isn't originally Scandinavian, he just ended up there. And Xaviar, who was a very powerful Justicar of the Camarilla, before officially declaring that his clan was now going to leave the Camarilla and join the Anarch movement. The ethereal and neurotic Clan Malkavian, also known as the Cassandras or the Clan of the Moon, represents the sort of telepathic, psychic type vampire, though they do still drink blood. The Malkavians are a funny little group because they have changed a lot over the years of the game existence. They used to be just straight up crazy people. There was sometimes an attempt at doing a serious exploration of mental health, but of course as the topic in general has moved more into the space of public acceptance, it's become a bit more labor intensive to actually deal with it properly. And personally, I think Vampire the Masquerade does a very good job with that. Basically, they're all in tune with this psychic network that they all share, and through which they have a very loose 
telepathic connection to each other. But of course every node in that network has their own little particular idiosyncrasies that distorts the view of the whole. They're an extremely diverse clan in whom they embrace because it tends to be mental oddballs and there's a lot of different ways in which you can be a mental oddball, but there does seem to be a certain, not preference, but just a statistically higher likelihood of them embracing intellectuals because they tend to be celebrated more for their oddballness and so hide it less. The clan has access to the discipline's all specs, which is highly sharpened senses, dominate, which is mind control, and obfuscate, which allows them to become undetectable. They used to have a discipline called dementation, which is now an amalgam power of dominate and obfuscate, which once again I'm not particularly happy with, but basically what it does is it makes other people go crazy. The Malkavian clan bane is their fractured perspective. They all have some wild and often destructive mental health disorder that they had a sort of predilection for during their life, even if there it never manifested. And no amount of therapy can help them with it. The clan compulsion is their propensity for delusion, because though they are connected through this magical, powerful network that can give them very meaningful visions of things that might happen in the future and things that are happening right now, they also can just as likely receive just complete bullshit streams of thought that will deeply upset their frame of mind. Trust me, I have quite a few schizophrenia symptoms myself. I know what I'm talking about. The Malkavian Antediluvian is called Malkav, and some people think that he is physically, or you know, rather non-physically, the actual telepathic network that connects all Malkavians. As such, even though they're a Camarilla clan, the Malkavians are not as religious in their denial of their Antediluvian, but then they are Malkavians, so nobody listens to them anyway, and the Camarilla doesn't really care. Some notable Malkavians include Anatole, who has, for the past couple centuries, been predicting the end of the world, and it turns out that he actually is correct. Therese Vorman, who is the Anarch Baron of Santa Monica, and who appeared in the video game Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. And none other than Alistair Crowley himself, who, believe it or not, is also the sire of Jekyll and Hyde. The ruthless and Darwinistic clan La Sombra, also known as the Keepers, or the Night Clan, represent the archetypal type of vampire that is a shadow being. I, I don't know that that's a thing that exists. But it is cool, and it fits thematically. A good way of describing the La Sombra is that they're the Ventru of the Sabbat. They are extremely capable of constructing and navigating complex social structures, so they run the administrative and down-to-earth side of the anti-Camarilla sect. And they are very selective in their embraces. You have to be a perfect match for what your sire is looking for, and they will then completely and utterly annihilate your livelihood over the course of years in order to test the unbreakability of your drive and willpower. If at the end of all that you're still focused, grinding, trying to secure the bag, they will reveal themselves to you. Interestingly, a lot of La Sombra are sailors. They're for some reason very closely associated with the sea, which I don't know how that fits, but I like it. And also the Catholic Church and religious institutions in general, but specifically the Catholic Church, the La Sombra, are deeply embedded in. And this is just another way in which they're sort of like an evil counterpart to the Venture, even though I mean the Venture were already kind of fucking evil, in that they will use anything to climb the social order. The clan has access to the discipline's dominate, which is mind control, oblivion, which used to be called obtenebration and was their ability to control the shadows, and you'll understand later why I'm so very angry about this, and potence, which is super strength. The clan bane is actually something very classic in that they don't cast proper reflections, not even on like digital cameras, though you probably will be able to identify them as themselves Themselves, the whole thing is going to be just busy with, with like shadowy artifacts 
and transparency issues, to the point where if you're unlucky it might even be a masquerade violation. This has led to the ironic situation that the clan, which utterly despises the idea of humans having any sort of position or value within vampire society, are dependent on them for just basic things like telling them how they look and having them pick out good outfits. The common compulsion that their beast drives them to is ruthlessness. They need to win. They need to achieve this goal and they will do anything, sacrifice anyone to achieve that. Failure is not an option. The La Sombra Antediluvian went by many names, so people just tend to call him La Sombra. Now the funny thing about La Sombra is that even though the Bruja would really like to claim this honor for themselves, they are actually the ones who kicked off the Anarch Revolt by diablerizing their Antediluvian. He was the first Antediluvian diablerized after the destruction of the first city, which is like so far in the past that the overwhelming majority of people don't even know that that was a thing, and he was diabolized by the youngest of his child, Gratiano de Veronese. Some notable Sabat include Lucita de Aragon, who was a Spanish princess and later became a very, very powerful archbishop in the Sabat, Zadkiel ben Aron, one of the absolute grandmasters of Optenebration, and Gian Galeazzo Visconti, who this is my favorite vampire, the Masquerade story. Basically, this guy, he got bored with the Sabat because it's a very violent and and direct kind of place. So what he did is he took all the Sabat hardliners in his city, Milan, and he switched from Sabat Archbishop to being a Camarilla Prince by just killing all of them. And the reason for this is that he found the intrigue and complicated politics of the Camarilla more interesting. <laughs> The stately and indifferent Clan Samizzi, also known as the Fiends, or the Old Clan, represents the classic Eastern European Dracula-style vampire, with a bit of a twist. Probably the most inhuman of all the clans, they don't even hate, like, regular living mortal people anymore. They just torture and deform them for pleasure. To continue an earlier analogy, the Timitsi are sort of the Toreador of the Sabbat, the great philosophers of sadism, who are solely focused on the question of what it means to be vampire. Because they don't really care about humans all that much, they tend to embrace absolutely massively exceptional people who just happen to strike their fancy at that particular moment. In order to maximize the potential of kindred, because that's all that humans are to them is just like little seeds that maybe or maybe not could have potential in some way to actually build something worthwhile out of. They have instituted centuries-long breeding programs to get the traits that they find most interesting. Yeah, this is how bad they are. And to be clear, eugenics is one of the least of their crimes. Being a, a very traditional clan that cares a lot about their own history, the Tsumitsi are known to be very, very polite and hold especially the Lords of Hospitality in almost religious regard. This is, of course, primarily because they are complete sociopaths who are fully on the orange and blue morality spectrum, and these kinds of very strict rules are the only thing that keeps them together. The clan has access to the disciplines animalism, which is control over animals, dominate, which is mind control, and protein, which in their case is the ability to shape flesh. In a time where disciplines were not design efficiency to death, this was called vicissitude, and it's the main standout ability of their clan that they will physically change themselves and others, usually more others in more horrendous ways, but they also change themselves to be whatever they want to be, often going very far away from the human form. And this is now an amalgam power of Dominant and Protea. The Clan Bane is called Grounded, and it used to be that they needed to sleep surrounded by their own grave soil. But in V5 they changed this into something that I personally think is a lot cooler. 
in that now they need to sleep surrounded by something that is ironically a very core cool aspect of like their their mortal identity that they used to have like their particular castle or maybe their ethnic group could still be grave soil by the way this also kind of means that the Tsumitsu don't really travel all that much it's a bit of a logistical challenge the clan compulsion is covetousness which is also a classic vampire thing to do where they like see something that they really 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 want for themselves and they will go to great lengths to get it the Tsumitsu antediluvian is known as the eldest and though as members of the Sabat, of course they are rather happy that this creature is no more they do share its vision and even even respect it, sort of, for going all the way into a direction of complete and utter inhumanity. A common saying among the Tsumitsi is that instead of having a beast and a remnant mortal soul inside of it, the eldest just had two beasts. Some notable to Bart include Sasha Vikos, who has turned themselves completely androgynous and is a very radical member of the Sabat, known as their chief torturer. Radu Bistri, who used to be the Prince of Bistritz and is now a high-ranking member of the Sabat, himself originating in one of those breeding programs. And of course, yes, the Count Dracula, who actually is a master of Koldunic sorcery, which is an even older form of magic that the Tsumitsi had access to before they adopted vicissitude. It's basically like an Avatar The Last Airbender style spirits of the land element bending. The young and self-interested clan Hakata, also known as the Lazarines or the Clan of Death, represents the archetypal vampire who is a corpse. Now the thing about the Hakata is that they're less a clan than a bunch of bloodlines in a trench coat. They formed in the 21st century through a ritual called the Family Reunion, which united uh, the Giovanni, the Samedi, the Cappadocians, and many, many of their cousins. And because they are composed of so many different groups, they have very different practices for embrace, because they didn't just completely shed their old cultures. But much of the core of Clan Hakata is made up of groups like the Giovanni, who used to actually take up this particular clan slot in earlier editions, or the Duncerns, or the Putanescas, who are very old mortal families who would go through generation and generation and generation, and some of them would be embraced into the vampire aspect of the family. Because they are, at this point, the only clan that is completely outside of any of the major sects or ideologies, they are a little bit insular. Family, though not necessarily blood anymore, and trust count for everything among the Hakata. And part of the reason for this is that they founded themselves as a self-defense thing, a last ditch desperate effort because most of them got almost annihilated by the Second Inquisition. The clan has access to the discipline's auspex, which is highly sharpened senses, fortitude, which is supernatural toughness, and Oblivion, which they share with Clan La Sombra. But instead of being, you know, shadow bending, or anything even remotely thematically related to shadow bending, it's necromancy. Because of some obscure law technicality that says that both of these things are related th in the law. Like, not mechanically, they're just really completely different concepts. But because of some obscure thing in the law, they have to be put into one discipline. And so in practice, what you have is an oblivion that is actually two different disciplines with completely different abilities, but because of how the rules work, in theory, unless the GM, which is probably going to do this, forbids it explicitly, you can pick from the abilities of necromancy and shadow bending like willy-nilly, completely annihilating the identity of the trademark ability of two really cool clans. And my question is, was it worth it? Was it really that important to convey mechanically to players that these two concepts are related within the lore of the game? Or maybe was it too expensive to get another one of these beautiful icons here made? I just, I really don't get it, and it makes me mad. The clan bane is the painful kiss, which the kiss is a slang term for when a vampire bites and drains someone, which usually is a very pleasant experience for the victim. But in the case of the Hakata, it's even more excruciating than it should be. Now, it used to be that all these different bloodlines had their own little flaws, like the Samedi and the Cappadocians. They just straight up 
Europe used to look like corpses, or the Nagaraja had to consume the flesh of their victims in order to gain any sustenance. Which is interesting because this means they always have to kill the victim that they're draining, and also it takes a while to do it. But what they did, and I promise you this is 100% just game design reasons, is they said, well, here because of through magic they now all have the Giovanni clan bane, and the old ones are no longer a thing. Which, let me tell you, a lot of game masters do not like to run it that way. The clan compulsion that they commonly suffer from is kind of weird, but I think very cool. It's called morbidity, and it's this very strong drive to investigate death. This could be diagnosing a medical problem with someone that they sense is dying, or it could be solving a murder mystery. The Hikata Antediluvian is the thing that unites them, by the way, because though they are all various different bloodlines with different founders, they are all ultimately descended of Cappadocius. Another of the more kindred affairs involved Antediluvians, Cappadocius was actually diabolized by Augustus Giovanni some time ago, which is why he used to count as the Antediluvian of Clan. Giovanni. Some notable Hikata include Isabel Giovanni, who has infiltrated every single one of the major sects into like very high positions at one point or another. Pochtli, the founder of the Pisanop bloodline, who actually died in order to create the conditions that uh, led to the formation of the Hikata, and the Capuchin, who is the de facto political leader of the Hikata, and who may not even be one of their clan descended of Cappadocius at all. The clandestine and isolated clan Banu Hakim, also known as the Asamites, or the Clan of the Hunt, represents the archetypal Orient-type vampire that is, like, from the Orient. That's like a thing. I mean, yeah, technically all vampire clans are from the Middle East, because that was where the first city was located. I have a personal fascination with the Banu Hakim, I love them very much, and they are sort of modeled after the historical assassins, down to the idea that they lived in like an isolated mountain fortress called Alamut. And though they do kill people for money, their main intended role in vampire society is as a sort of law enforcement. This is also one of the main groups that they like to embrace from, specifically investigators, because they have this drive to hunt down, if you will, the truth, and a propensity for self-sacrifice for a higher cause. They also like to get learned people, scholars on board, if they prove that they have a lot of dedication to what they do uh, over like an extended observation period. They also kinda used to like not embrace women. After Banu Hakim has been embraced, they are subjected to a rigorous seven year training program followed by another seven years of indenture to their master. And if they fail any of the tests, or if they show any amount of disobedience, their master straight up just kills them. Probably involving diablery too, which is one of the reasons why the Banu Hakim have had a fairly strained relationship with the Camarilla at times, because in the Camarilla, that is considered the absolute worst crime a vampire could possibly commit. The clan has access to the discipline's blood sorcery, which is like the same thing that the Tremere have, the blood magic, celerity, which is super speed, and obfuscate, which allows them to become undetectable. In earlier editions, they kind of had three different loadouts for disciplines because they had a warrior, a vizier, and a sorcerer cased. Uh, and their thing wasn't the same discipline as the Tremere, they had their own thing. It did have a greater focus on, like, blood magic in the actual literal sense of controlling blood, which in a vampire society you can imagine how scary that is. Their clan bane has changed a lot over the years for law reasons. Currently it is the overwhelming urge when they taste the blood of another vampire to diablerize that vampire because they are attracted fundamentally to the blood of evildoers that need to be punished. And in a sense, being a vampire is such an unbelievable transgression against the natural order that it makes that irresistible to the Banu Hakim. Now it used to be that each of the three castes had their own little clan bane, but the one they all shared was that uh, their skin would grow darker with age. This is a real thing that used to be the case, and I guess someone at some point figured out that 
<laughs> it's just, this isn't like the best idea to have. Like it's a little, ever so slightly a little bit problematic. In line with their bane is their compulsion to pass judgment. If someone that they know or in their presence does something that they consider to be unethical, they will feel an urge to drink from them, to enact punishment by taking some of their blood. Which of course, given that they're usually surrounded by vampires, would lead to the problematic situation of it triggering their clan bane. The Banu Hakim Antediluvian is a guy called Hakim. And the story that the Ban Hakim tell about him is that he basically embraced himself as a mortal by killing two immensely powerful vampires of the second generation as punishment for their corruption. Some claim that his goal is to exterminate all vampires, which is almost definitely not true. But it's a convenient way to say, oh, those damned foreigners. Some notable Banu Hakim include Urshulgi, who rather recently awoke from Torpor and looked around, just immediately took control of the clan and said, hang on, who is this Islam guy? And why are you worshipping him instead of Hakim? Repent your idolatry or you will be destroyed immediately. Which has kind of led to a schism that is currently plaguing the clan where a lot of Banu Hakim sort of went to the Camarilla. Fatima al Fakadi, who for a time was one of their most effective assassins and probably the first woman to ever be embraced into the clan. And Montgomery Kirvin, who is a very young Sabat aligned or formerly Sabat aligned Banu Hakim, who through sheer luck in the early 1990s managed to become immensely powerful by diablerizing Mithras, the Ventru Prince of London. The nomadic and deceitful clan Ravnos, also known as the Haunted or the Clan of Seekers, is supposed to represent the vampiric archetype of, uh, how do I say this? How do I best put this? They're gypsies. They're basically, the idea is that they're gypsies that will sneak into your house at night and drink your blood. Look, you have to consider that the Vampire the Masquerade, the first book came out in 1991, cultural like sensitivities were a bit different back then. We're talking about like White Wolf, which even in 1994, which was a few years after Vampire came out, published this, World of Darkness Gypsies. That's the book where they had a real life category of minority groups that they took and made them mechanically distinct magical beings, like distinct from humans in the same way that like vampires or werewolves or changelings are in the World of Darkness lore. Which is like wild that they thought this was a cool thing to do even back then. But yes, the core of the Ravnos clan is of and traveling with usually the various different ethnic groups descended of the Roma. In the West at least, like they're a whole different clan in India that basically has very little to do with the rest of the world. Especially the new edition has changed a lot of the baggage that comes with this without having to retcon anything into like reframing them a little bit as trickster daredevil type people. And like just going away from ethnicity for a moment, those are really the preferred group that the Ravnos embrace from. Adrenaline junkies and like social outcasts that manage to make their own way in life. Trailblazers unperturbed with the strict rules of polite society, who like to pull pranks every once in a while, have a good sense of humor, and want to use their eternal unlife to actually see something of the world. In other words, absolute legends. The clan has access to the discipline's animalism, which is control over animals, obfuscate, which allows them to become undetectable, and presence, which is alluring charisma. The latter two form the amalgam power called chemistry, which used to be actually a discipline that they had, along with fortitude. Once again, a change I'm not particularly happy with for blah 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 reasons we've already gone into, but basically chemistry allows them to create illusions to fool other people. Their clan base 
train is doomed, which is in no way evocative of what that actually mechanically means, even though it makes sense in the lore, once again. And basically it means they need to sleep in a different location every night. Now I'm not talking like the other side of the room, but at least a kilometer away. Their common compulsion is to tempt fate, which really is just the classic adrenaline junkie move of doing something extremely dangerous for no other reason than it would be cool. The Ravnos Antediluvian is called Zapatasura, but he's also known as Drakian, and he very notably woke up from Torpor in 1999, sending literally every single Ravnos in the entire world into a homicidal frenzy for a week. This obviously almost entirely destroyed the whole clan. The overwhelming majority of Ravnos just died during this time, and like, they used incredibly powerful eastern vampires, which are a different category of vampires called Quajin, uh, which are not even probably related to the vampires and Vampire the Masquerade, and wizards used a bunch of orbital satellite nukes to stop this guy from the just path of destruction he was cutting through India. Now you know why antediluvians can be kinda spooky. Some notable Ravnos include Khalil Ravana, who is deeply addicted to the act of diablery, Alexis Sorokin, an unparalleled master thief who is being hunted by the Camarilla, and Sinevea, a rather ancient Ravnos who prefers to spend her time mentoring younger groups of vampires and sometimes other supernatural beings, usually while pretending to not be a vampire at all. The devout and pestilential clan ministry, also known as the Corruptors or the Followers of Set, represents the kind of demonic vampire that is just evil and opposed to all things that are good and proper Christian stuff. It functions as a sort of vampire church that puts out the official vampire religion, obviously, in their view. Uh, and it kind of functions in practice as like an anti-real church, which instead of espousing virtues, espouses doing sin. And by that I mean like all of the sin. They don't just like indulging in extreme hedonism, but also actively annihilating the compassionate fabric of society. They are serious cultists, and those are also like the exact kind of people that they want in their clan for their embrace. They usually mortals who were already involved with their splintered and fractured devil cults while they were alive. And also, you can become a follower of Set no matter what clan you're from, even as a vampire you can essentially convert. That doesn't mean that you like change your abilities and get a new clan bane, but you are fully accepted into the clan and will be taught their powers. The whole embracing evil and corruption and destructive hedonistic indulgence does actually have a religious purpose and that they believe that you need to go to the absolute limits of experience in order to be able to free yourself from the flesh prison that your soul is trapped in. And becoming a vampire for them is just the first step on that journey. And once you have achieved that, you'll be in some sort of like perverse nirvana state that they all want to achieve. This plays heavily into the various doomsday cult aspects that they also have. The clan has access to the disciplines Obfuscate, which allows them to become undetectable, Presence, which is alluring charisma, and Protean, which allows them to gain animal traits and transform into animals, here usually snakes. This discipline used to be called Serpentis and it was much more focused focused on like magic and magical aspects, but yet again, a whole clan's mechanical identity really needed to be condensed down into a single amalgam power. Honestly, if Vampire 5 didn't have the best hunger in humanity mechanics by like a light year of all the additions, I would despise it. The clan bane is that they absolutely abhor the light, and not just sunlight, but any bright light. Even like a full moon, you know, they don't- it doesn't hurt them specifically, but they find it very irritating. And if they ever are exposed to sunlight, it is especially damaging to them. Their clan compulsion is transgression, which is about manipulating people into breaking their most sacred ethical and moral precepts, spreading corruption everywhere they go. The Ministry Antediluvian is none other than the Egyptian god Set which is why most of the clan is situated in and around Europe and the general Maghreb sort of region. And the thing about Set is that he worships 
a, well, it's not even demonic anymore sort of entity that exists in the Great Void and all it wants to do is destroy and be evil and spread corruption. Some notable ministers include Kementiri, who is a corruptor so vile that the Camarilla created a whole slew of extremely powerful institutions just to hunt her down. Nefertiti, a very powerful, pure, unadulterated narcissist who sees herself as the rightful vampire queen of all of Europe, and she has managed to turn several animals, especially snakes, into vampires. And Hesha Ruhadze, a scholar of the occult so renowned that his sire actually renamed himself into Abu Ruhadze, so like, the father of Ruhadze. Also, he has like a really cool monocle. And that's it. That's the 13 clans. There is also something called caitiff, which is vampires that don't know what their clan is. They sometimes have very interesting combinations of disciplines and are not really bound to the disciplines of their clan, which is sometimes the exact reason why their sire abandoned them. While that may sound very cool, bear in mind that caitiff are the absolute lowest of the low in vampire society. No one likes them, no one wants anything to do with them, it's not really advisable to play one. So there you go, even if before watching this you knew nothing about Vampire the Masquerade, now you have a functional, basic knowledge of what you maybe should be aware of if you're going to play the game. There is a lot of VTM lore out there, and that isn't even touching on all of the other World of Darkness properties. Even the clans I mentioned have, like, huge swathes that I couldn't even begin to get into. If you found any of them particularly interesting, I I highly recommend the White Wolf Wiki for further information. Or if you prefer video learning, I can recommend the Primogen's channel, who has a lot of in-depth videos on most of the clans. If you want to see how Vampire the Masquerade is actually played, check out LA by Night, which is an actual play podcast set in the California Anarch Free State. Uh, with some tremendous characters played by very talented actors and a game master that is so excellent I personally count him among probably like the top five in the entire world for any system. They even have like a only recently embraced fish out of water don't know what is going on type character which is excellent because they explain to her a lot of the important things that are the case about the vampire world so it's great for people who have no idea about the lore. And look Ultimately, while they may be interesting, it doesn't matter how much of lore you consume of Vampire the Masquerade, ultimately what the game experience is about around most tables is for it to be a game of personal horror. It's about your relationships uh, and your struggles with the vampiric condition, the political maneuvering inside a very rich and, dare I say, realistic world packed full of mystery. Thank you so much for watching this monstrous video. <laughs> like, comment, subscribe, share this to your relevant communities, but do not spam them. Consider supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar, buying some of my merchandise or my short story collection. And in that spirit, boy, this was a long one. Probably the longest video I've ever done. I don't know why I did this. I woke up one morning and I decided, you know what? Dude, like, just take two weeks out of the video making schedule to work, like, a long, long time every day to get this done. And <laughs> this basically, like, suspended everything else in my life to do this. Uh, very, very strange, but I've, I've been enjoying it. So maybe if you like this sort of long-form content, five people who are still watching this at the end of the video, leave a comment. And in that spirit, see you around, cunts.